Amen. Hey, good morning, Bamel family. It is so good to be back with you. I've never been on staff here. I've never been a member here, but you have, a, you have taken my whole family in like a member of your family. So anytime I get a chance to be back here, uh, just the last couple of times I've been a guest speaker here, it's been in the month of July. I think I need to do a better month, a better job of choosing a different month, maybe February or March next time. But hey, it's been all, this morning has been so good for me. Just my heart is so full of the many spiritual gifts and gifts that have been used from this stage today, communion today, just did something for my heart. Thank you for leading me there and to hear just some of the testimonies and uh, having teenagers sharing things about what's going on in life of this church. And Derek, you and the praise team, what a blessing. Can we put our hands together and just thank God for this morning, the many gifts that have been used. Uh, I was raised in a family where almost everybody had the gift of singing except me. It just kind of skipped over me. My brother was a worship minister here for five years. My sister, to the day she died, was involved in some kind of worship ministry or was on a, uh, any church she was a part of, she was doing that. My dad and my mom have had gifts of doing it. It just kind of skipped over me. I had a buddy back in college. He asked me to go preach for him one Sunday. He was preaching in a small church. It was a church of 15 people. He said, I need you to go preach for me this day. And if one family has gone, the church will be down to seven. So one family was like half the church. How many of you grew up in small churches like that? Anybody? 15 people? Some, okay, we got a few. So he said, I need, you go, I need you to preach a combined class, and I need you to preach a sermon. So I went prepared to do that. And little did I know when I showed up, I was also the song leader for the day. I had the opening prayer, the closing prayer, the prayer for the bread, cup, and offering. And because of a lack of mobility in the room, I was the only person who could pass trays that day. I did everything. <laughs> And this was a church that could sit about 225 people. They were down to 15, but people were still sitting in the pews where they had been sitting for decades. So to do communion still took about 10 minutes for me to take trays all around the room. And it was all right. I preached my first sermon when I was 10 years old. So I've been preaching for a long time. I, I've been in front of churches for a long time, like leading prayers and things like that. But singing was something that just skipped over me. So my wife, the moment, we were newlyweds at the time. The moment she heard I was leading, leading singing, she just started giggling. She was like, this is going to be the best thing ever. I'm glad we didn't have cell phones at the time with a video. So it's, it came time for me to lead singing. So I stepped up. And I, I've been in Churches of Christ long enough that I knew a few things. I knew there's a cadence. So I know when you stand up to uh, lead a song, you say something like, hey, I need you to turn your Bibles to number 723, 723. So you say the full number, and then you break it down by the single digit, right? So I have that right. And then all my life, I'd send people, even my brother sometimes, move his hand when they lead singing. So I started moving my hand. My wife was sitting on the fourth row. And I remember her kind of, she did like this wave to get my attention, and she put one hand in the air, the other hand on top of it, and she made this motion like <laughs> Just put your hand down, Josh. So I decided, okay, maybe I don't need to move my hand. So I went through the worst of that rest of the service. There was one guy, Cowboy, and Cowboy slept through the entire worship service. He slept through not just the sermon. He slept through the songs. He slept through the prayer, everything. I had to nudge Cowboy to give him the bread, and I'm not exaggerating. He fell asleep between the bread and the cup. I had to nudge him again. He slept through everything. And after church, I saw Cowboy coming down the center aisle, and he was, he was looking at me, not smiling. I was like, this guy's about to shake my hand and say, great job, young man. I was prepared to respond with, what was your favorite part? How did God move in your life? And he slipped me a $50 bill that morning, so I just let it go, all right? So I have been, I've been paid off before. So if you have the need to go to sleep today, it's fine. Give me a 20, 50, 100, and we're, we're fine. I sometimes share that story when I preach at churches who have an early service, and I was doing this in Dallas, at 8 a.m. worship service, and I, I shared that story, and some guy after church came up and he said, I heard you tell that story, and I was so moved in worship today that, that he gave me $180, so I promise that I'm going to tell that story for the rest of my life, all right? It's going, hey, man, well, family, seriously, it is so good to be with you. I, rest, I wish the rest of my family could be here uh, this morning. And there have been a lot of gifts that have been used all over this campus this morning. And sometimes when we think spiritual gifts, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, and we can go ahead and throw that up on the screen, where the Spirit is activating. There are gifts that have been activated inside of all of us. And sometimes when we read something like 1 Corinthians 12, we may think about spiritual gifts, like Derek's ability to lead worship, or, or preaching, or teaching, or ministering to children, or especially in the context of a worship service or being on a campus, we think about gifts in that kind of way. But I know, I think, that this church, what I know of you is you have a kingdom heart. So you don't just think about how we make worship services great. It's how do we launch people into the community to make a difference. And with that said, like we know there are a lot of gifts inside of us, gifts of kindness, gifts of hospitality, of friendship, of, of that, that go out into places all over the world. 
Now, as you look at chapter 12, verse 11, and you see how the Spirit of God is activating in every single believer gifts, I want you to think just for a moment about what this says about God. Not just what it says about people who are gifted, what it says about God who is willing to enter into partnership to gift people. So I love how the teens all like sit up front, like all of y'all right here. And one thing, when I get a chance to like speak at church camps and youth rallies, what I try to remind kids of are a few things. One, I want teenagers to know at a really young age that God doesn't reluctantly save you. Meaning like God doesn't like say, okay, this person was like Maddox wants to be baptized today. So we're going to take a vote in heaven to see if we want Maddox to be saved or not. Like God is so willing and excited to save people. What I also want teenagers to know is every single person God saves, God wants to use for his glory. Like God doesn't want to waste the salvation. Like there's no, way, no one God saves that God doesn't want to use somehow for the good of the kingdom all over the world. And a lot of times I want to remind teenagers that because I preach in front of a multi-generational church where I often sit with people who may be 60, 70, 80 years old who are questioning their worth, questioning do they have a gift? Have they been used by God? Asking all these questions. Like this is for the whole church to know. When God saves people, God wants to use Everything God saves. Now, I can do some things that you can. I preached my first sermon when I was 10 years old. I'm sometimes invited to speak in front of teens. I'm sometimes invited to preach the gospel in front of leadership groups or be a guest speaker like today. Like there are some things I can do that you can't. Some of you, you may not ever have an opportunity to do what I'm doing this morning. To step up in front of people, to open up the Bible, and to try to inform and to inspire folks. You may not be able to do what I do, but there are a lot of things you do that I can't do. Like I can't go into some of the, some of the lunch places where you are, some of the businesses and offices where you are. Like God is bringing gifts to life inside of the body of Christ, in your case, to bless the Houston area and beyond. Now, I want you to see this image that pops up right now, and I want you to think about this image. Uh, some of you don't think about window screens much, but I want you to think just for a moment about window screens. Like a lot of times we don't wake up in the morning and thank God for all the window screens that we have and what they do. But I want you to think about window screens. Now, they, in some, some, some form of window screens have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but only about 150 years have there been affordable window screens for people to have. And when they were first developed in a way where they were affordable, it was a game changer for people. Because not only was this uh, something about like keeping windows open or like cool air, like this was keeping bugs out. You were filtering things. You were keeping bugs from coming in. And especially 100 plus years ago, we're talking about a lot of diseases that would come in through mosquitoes and through bugs. So this, it saved a lot of lives. But it was about keeping some things out and letting some things like air, wind come in. It was a filter. Now today, if I were to ask you what comes to your mind when you think about a screen, I bet hardly any of you would mention window screen. You would mention, mention a cell phone screen, which in some ways performs the same thing that a window screen does. It filters things. And on your phone, you get to make choices of what contacts are you going to let on your phone and who are you going to filter out. When it comes to social media, you can often choose who are the voices you want speaking into your life and who are the voices I don't want speaking into my life. It's a screen that sometimes, in a way, serves as a filter. Now, I want you to think what our friends did this morning when you let us in communion right here around this table. That at communion, here's one thing. That when it comes to communion, we don't get to choose who God allows to come to the table or not. Amen. Jesus does. So we, go, we don't get to choose the invite list. So when it comes to the communion, the bread and the cup, we don't get to choose who comes and we don't get to choose the menu. Like it's not like God asks, is the bread and cup good enough or do you want an appetizer next week or dessert the week after? Like it's always going to be the bread and the cup. And at this table, it is God who sends out the invites. It's God who makes space at the table. So what does it mean for us to continue to become the churches? Who don't screen or filter people out, but invite people in. And when we're in, we're helping these gifts come to life in all of us. Look in your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you'll see this up on the screen. 
1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26 says this. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable uh, are treated with special modesty. While, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And for the reading of the word of God, the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Many parts, one body, together in Christ. So I have a friend, his name's Luke. We went to, we've been best buddies for about 20 years. He preaches at a church in Austin. And one year, one summer, we were in grad school together and we were taking a class on the church. So we're talking about stuff like 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this was a short course, so we were going to school 8 to 5 every day. And then I think it was Tuesday afternoon, we went and we decided to go get a workout in after church or after, after school. So we did. We were working out and Luke decided... He was having a chest workout that day that he wanted to put his hands inside of the rings and do just some air push-ups. You can go deeper on them. And then he decided that wasn't enough, so he hung a 75-pound dumbbell around his neck and began to do them. And when he did, he felt something move on his neck. <laughs> and he thought something wasn't right. Well, everything was okay until the next day we're in class, and he sneezed. And when he sneezed, half of his face went numb. And he looked over to me, and a lot of my friends, they call me boss. I'm not bossy, just Josh Boss Ross at Rhyme. So he's like, hey, boss, I think my face just went numb. So he left school, sends me a text message that I need to take him to the ER. So I went to his house, picked him up, I need to take him to the ER. He came out of his house holding a trash can. I didn't think he was bringing that trash can into my car because it matched his outfit. And one of my greatest phobias in life is throw up, all right? I, I'm not one of these people that if you throw up around me, I throw up. I'm one of these people that if you throw up around me, I will despise you for the rest of your life. I'm better since I'm a dad. But I remember when he got in that car, I was like, God, if you keep him from throwing up in my car, I will give half of what I have to the poor. Like, I will, God, whatever you want, I will do it. And thank goodness it wasn't until I parked the car that he threw up inside of the ER. But they let me go back in the back with him to help him when the doctor came in. So the doctor came in and starts asking questions of what have you been doing? And he's like, well, and, and then I had to like share with the doctor what he did. He hung a dumbbell around his neck. He sneezed. And the doctor kind of, you know, it was just a little minor thing wrong with his neck. He was going to be just fine. But the doctor said, look, what do you do? And Luke was like, I don't have a job right now. I'm in school. And the doctor was like, what, what do you, what do you, what degree are you working on? He was like a master's degree. And the doctor just started laughing sarcastically. Like, <laughs> like a, uh, someone with a master's degree probably should know that you don't need to hang a 75 pound dumbbell around your neck. And the doctor began giving him a talk about how the body works. Like there are some things your body is made to do, and there are some things that your body should never do. Like hang a dumbbell that size around your neck. Like there are some things the body of Christ should do, and there are some things the body of Christ should never do. Like the body of Christ should never be all about gossip or sharing lies or letting politics drive our faith more than our faith drives how we think about all of life. Like there are some things the body should do and there are some things the body shouldn't do. 
And this is an important part of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. Because if you read 1 Corinthians, there are all kind of divisions in that church. And they're competing. They're competing in ways of like, who, who baptized you? Because who baptized me was better than the person who baptized you. What spiritual gift do you have? Because maybe my spiritual gift is better. And Paul's trying to break a lot of that stuff down. And in chapter 12, he wants to talk about how important the whole body is. And when he starts off, you'll see this on the screen. In verse 12 and 13, he talks about baptism and the Lord's Supper. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. One thing I loved about some of the ancient baptistries from years ago, we're talking third, fourth centuries, is many of them had an entrance and they had an exit. Because many people were sometimes being baptized in the same worship services. So it wasn't just a logistical thing, like in order to get more people in the water, we're just going to lead them in and lead them out. This was, a, this was something they wanted people to know the rest of their lives. Here's the deal. When it comes to baptism, you're stepping into the water, but you're not going to go back and be the same person you were before you entered into the water. So for Maddox Lane, who was baptized today, like you entered into the water, but you're not... You're not Supposed to go back and be the same kind of person. Like we're, we're a church that's going in a new direction, right? Like we're moving with Jesus. I've heard it said before that when it comes to the way the New Testament talks about baptism, the New Testament doesn't argue for baptism as much as the New Testament argues from baptism. And in saying that, I'm elevating baptism. Because the way you see even baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this isn't Paul saying this is why people who haven't been baptized should be baptized. This is Paul saying because you have been baptized, you need to know, you need to remember that you are a part of the body of Christ. Like because you've been baptized, there's some things we say and there's some things we don't say. Because we have been baptized, there's some things we don't let into our homes or into our bodies. Like because you've been baptized, there is a life you have been called to live. And in chapter 12, it's because you've been baptized. You need to always remember you are a church with many parts who form this one body. So honor it. Live like it. I was reading a book on community and the power of community in the church a few years ago. And an example a guy uses, he said that he and his wife went on a vacation. And they put their dog up in you know, one of those doggy hotels, which my wife and I said we would never do until we got a dog. You just pay way too much money and dogs, you know, you don't think they're that important, right? But they did. For seven days, this guy talked about it. And then at the end of vacation, they came back. And before they went back to the house, they went to pick the dog up. They were missing the dog. They get the dog. And for the next hour, the dog is shedding hair everywhere. So they call the vet because they think maybe, maybe this dog has picked up a virus. And they call and they're like, every time we pet the dog, like just lumps of hair Clumps of hair are just coming off on our hands. What, what, what should we do? And the, and the vet said, oh, no, here's the deal. The dog misses you. The dog is just missing touch. Put the dog in your lap. Pet the dog for a few minutes, and the hair will stop falling out. And sure enough, it worked. So the moral of the story is the bald people in the room today, will you just give, put your hands on them? Will you love on them a little bit? They need some hugs. They need some touch. It's something about community that is so good. But you probably know things like geese fly further, 70% further when they fly together in a group than when they fly alone. And so, so, so it is with the church. In 1992, in the Olympics in Barcelona, you've probably seen this picture before. Derek Redman was set to compete in the 400-meter race. And the moment he took off, and he had been training for this for years, the moment he took off, he fell to the ground. He had torn, he tore his hamstring. This is 1992. He's competing. And then he decides in that moment, he's, there's no chance he's going to win. Like by the time he stands up, people are already crossing the finish line. But then he starts, he starts hobbling around the track because if he competed this long, could train this long, to go across the finish line, he was going to make it. So he's hobbling across the track, and then this man runs out on the track. Now, this was in 1992, which today this would never happen, right? With all security and snipers and who knows what. Like, there's no way this would happen. But this was his dad who ran out of the stands to go and take, take hold of his son. And together, a father and a son crossed the finish line. 
Now, almost any Olympics today, you'll see this image of Derek and his father, you know, running the race and crossing the finish line. And even though he didn't win, he got last place. This is a story 30 years later that is still being told. It's still so inspiring. And sometimes I think if Derek, if Derek would have gone all the way across that finish line all by himself, would it be the story it is today? And maybe it would. But there was something about a father running after a wounded son, taking hold of that son, and going through the finish line with him that made this a story that will go on for decades, if not centuries. And so it is with the church, and for what I've known of Bamel now for almost 20 years, I know this to be true about you. Because you did this with my family, with the loss of my sister back in 2010, you have done this for each other. And today there may be someone who is walking. You feel like you were hurt and you were wounded and you were walking alone. You have a church family in this room, in this worship experience, that wants to come alongside of you to let you know you don't have to run alone. You don't have to walk alone. We're in this together till the very, to the very end. This is the gift we give to each other, and it's the gift that we allow others to give to us. So will you bow your heads, close your eyes. And God, I give you thanks because this whole idea of the church, it was your idea. You launched it. You created it knowing that we are weak, knowing that we will fail. So God, today, I pray that you increase our faith in you and you help us know how much you believe in us. God, I pray uh, for the Bama church that you will continue to unite them around Christ, draw them together. And all the ways that you're diversifying this church, all the ways you're doing it. God, through it, bring great unity. And through that unity, may the mission of the good news of Jesus spread throughout this community and beyond. So today we're asking for the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to be upon us, to bring everything in us to life in ways that we could never imagine. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen.